don't know like how to not Hi guys, today we're reading like Lana Del Rey. She was one of my top artists in Spotify. Love her music. I don't know, each artist has their own distinct sound and I really like, you know, her stuff. So my favorite from her are Say Yes to Heaven and Young and Beautiful. You know, if I ever get married, I'm playing those at my wedding. But her reading list, her favorites book list just makes so much sense. I don't know, like Lolita, Sylvia Plath, you know books on Hollywood just makes a lot of sense to me. I think that her distinct cinematic and poetic qualities in her music can be attributed to her reading habits. I think these books have contributed to that. And she also references a lot of 1950s and 60s pop culture references in some of her music, which, you know, kind of makes sense with this. But let's just get on into the video. We're at Blue Bottle. Here's the setup. Matcha, matcha, and then books. Okay, so the first book is Hollywood Babylon by Kenneth Anger. Now, I do have my trusty laptop here because I took down notes because editing takes forever, okay? And I'm a full-time student still, so I'm on a rush for this one, but I wrote down what I thought. Sorry if I'm not looking exactly at the camera. I promise, hopefully I'll time manage better next time and I can stop having to like keep on referencing my laptop, but yeah. Okay, so Hollywood Babylon by Kenneth Anger. It's a controversial book going into the dark and shady side about Hollywood's golden age. This was published in 1959 and is a collection of scandalous stories and gossip about Hollywood celebrities from the early 20th century. So he goes into the scandals and misfortunes of various stars such as Fatty Arbuckle, Clara Bow, and Jean Harlow. No, you don't understand. I feel like every chapter there was a new character and maybe it's because I'm not super well versed in, you know, old Hollywood. I just did not know any of these people. The only like name I ever recognized was MGM because of like the Las Vegas chain. I feel like every chapter there was new person they were talking their life story about. And like the stuff in here, like every chapter was packed with drama. But also search up trigger warnings because this shit is crazy. But anyways, um, Anger's writing style is like crazy dramatic and provocative with the book being like famous for its vivid and crude storytelling, which makes a lot of sense. But the biggest thing, okay, I went into this book thinking, I was like, oh, like, what can I say about this book? It's, you know, nonfiction, factual, like they're just facts. It's crazy. The stuff in here they mentioned is crazy. And then I found out that Hollywood Babylon is quite controversial since its accuracy has been highly questioned over the years. Like the truth to lie ratio is one to 10. Like half this is not even true. I was like, damn. So. Think of it more like a dramatized exploration of old Hollywood's darker side rather than a factual historical account. A mistake I made when I first went into reading this. Is this a popular book? I was reading it thinking it was factual, which is crazy that I did that. And every chapter I was just shocked. I was like, how does this happen? Where is he getting all this drama from? I feel like it's more for film lovers and people who are super into old Hollywood because an average person like me, interesting, yes, but I just did not care for a lot of the stuff. I feel like I read the reviews and a lot of film lovers are like, this is a staple of my bookshelf. So I think that's really cool. Like I just did not know who half these people were. It was like reading Dostoevsky, like I gotta make a family tree, like what is going on? I just could not keep up, but I don't know. So next 
we have Ariel, The Poetry Collection by Sylvia Plath. Now I know, I know she is a racist and bad person, but just, I will get into that later with the bell jar or like my thoughts on that. But I have a lot to say about this tiny ass book. I, I wrote down so much. I was literally doing it during school lunch, but anyways. So Ariel is a poetry collection by Sylvia Plath. And these poems were written in, I think the last month of her life and they were rushed in at a rate of like two to three poems a day so just take it as you will and it was released in 1965 two years after her death or suicide you know Sylvia Plath is quite famous but this the poems in this collection are known for the vivid imagery emotional intensity and themes of identity feminism and the complexities of the human relationships which all this adds up like if you think about it it is haunting that you know a lot of these poems are about um just like trigger warning things you know it's just really sad and it's quite haunting once you like realize that Sylvia Plath like died a month but According to the internet, this collection includes some of her most famous works, which is Lady Lazarus, Ariel, and Daddy. The poems in here often reflect her personal struggles, which is like her experiences with mental illness, her wild marriage to the poet Ted Hughes, and just her thoughts on motherhood. It's celebrated for its intense emotions. And I do agree that the poems did bring, you know, a lot of emotion once you take in the context. Read the foreword. Okay, the poems are deeply expressive and impactful, and the themes and emotions explored in the poems still resonate with readers, which is what contributes to Plath's continuous legacy. That's why she's like still really famous. My thoughts on the title poem, Ariel. Apparently Ariel's the name of the horse, I think, her husband confirmed it or something. So she is holding on for dear life as, you know, she rides the horse and she's losing pieces of herself, shedding her past life. The whole poem experience, it kind of goes into the mental and emotional transformation the writer goes through as she eventually faces death. She's like charging into the sun or, you know, the future, I guess reincarnation type. But my issue is she uses like, okay, this whole thing she was using um, racial slurs in the poem, but I think this was the one where I was like, is it even necessary? Cause I was reading, I was like, what does this mean? Let me put up the meme. Like, I was just confused. It was like so unnecessary to the point where I was like, what does this mean? Like, I just didn't understand it. Okay, next poem, Daddy. Now, this is like one of the three well-known poems, but I feel like this one was the most disappointing to me. Okay, this is what Wikipedia says about the controversy. It employs controversial metaphors of the Holocaust to explain Plath's complex relationship with her father, Autoplath. So the poem is narrated by a woman speaking to her oppressive father. It kind of describes the speaker's efforts to emancipate herself from the control that the dad has over her, which is conveyed. But also I think my main issue and many other people's issue with it is that a Reddit user says it best. She is essentially co-opting the Holocaust for her own material when she has no direct or authentic claim to it as an event in which she then makes worse by imagining herself as a Jewish figure and not just writing on the Holocaust. And I really agree with it and I think that's one of my biggest issues. Like, And I get that literature is all about expressing yourself but I feel like you know some things you have to be a little more careful around. So the last poem Lady Lazarus. So this poem, the one-liners had potentials for me. Like there was one out of context though, like in the whole scheme of the entire poem, again, there's a lot of controversy. But my favorite was dying is an art. Like everything else, I do it exceptionally well. I think I just like those lines cause I don't know, when I was like feeling sad, I was like, Loki, like why am I so fucking good at everything? You know, like I can be really exceptionally overachieving but then at times like polar ends of the spectrum i can also be really really underachieving and just like a waste of space if you know this is another famous quote from her out of the ash i rise with my red hair and i eat men like air Ooh, like you know all the girlies on pinterest will be like femme fatale and i so agree like out of context but in the context of this whole poem i clearly wrote it would be my favorite if it weren't for the issues like, I like the one-liners. And call me basic, okay, I know, but these quotes are popular for a reason. It's about a 30-year-old woman who has attempted suicide three times. The poem describes her experiences of deep trauma each time she returns to Earth, a place which she is desperately trying to 
leave behind controversially again allusions to the holocaust in this poem her idea on this one and again what the controversy is about is she's using the holocaust as imagery to convey her own personal sense of hell so uh, you know and i just feel like for me those controversies are so like when i'm reading it i can't even focus on the poem because i'm just like oop, and that's all i was focused on the controversy on this overshadow the poems itself yeah guys i don't know if like the the lighting's like kind of wonky but yeah if it will focus this is the strawberry flavor <coughs> shit also like you know press on nails because i hate sitting in the fucking salon for like hours like i just can't properly get anything done here are some of my highlighted notes from when i first read this such people generally do too much talking and too little listening. Keep your eyes and ears wide open and your mouth closed if you wish to acquire the habit of prompt decision. Those who talk too much do little else. If you talk more than you listen, you not only deprive yourself of many opportunities to accumulate useful knowledge, but you also disclose your plans and purposes to people who will take great delight in defeating you because they envy you. So, we have Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill. And this is the landmark bestseller now revised and updated for the 21st century, which I found funny because it was published in 1937, okay? That's how old it is. Essentially, Think and Grow Rich is kind of regarded as a motivational class. Its principles have influenced countless individuals in their pursuit of personal and financial success. Like, there's this one table behind me in like calc that's always talking about like bitcoin ethereum like i'm just gonna maybe i should give them one of these books because we're a senior so we're turning 18 but i swear they're trying to convince each other to like buy stuff like i don't know it's it's funny overhearing some of their conversations but the book encourages readers to cultivate a success oriented mindset and take concrete actions to bring their aspirations to life so it's a classic self-help and personal development book. I personally think that, you know, the, the rich part, the title is kind of misleading. I think you could call it like how to get anything you want in life. But, you know, like you learn in the book, you got to attract people somehow. So I think money is a great way to do that because it doesn't like tell you how to get rich. Like the techniques here can be applied to not only how to get rich, how to get other things you want in life. To me, it was kind of like a manifestation book. Once you read a certain amount of self-help books, they just all kind of start sounding the same to you. It outlines the principles for achieving success and prosperity. And there are 13 different steps. So essentially the information here is drawn from the author um, Napoleon Hill's study of successful individuals and takes their common traits into the philosophy of success, which is this book. But honestly, I feel like the core principle was manifestation. I don't know. They, they called it the power of one's thoughts. The power of one's thoughts is to set clear goals, to maintain a burning desire for success, and to develop a positive mental attitude. And I feel like a lot of this book, to me, was just mental. It's like, how can you quit when you're so close to success? You never know. Like, you need that mentality. You need to, I don't know. And he emphasizes on the importance of personal initiative, imagination, and persistence in achieving one's goals. I know it sounds like common sense, but I think often when we don't reread these self help books, you can't just read self help books once. Like, you gotta drill it in your mind and remind yourself every two months. Because it's in your mind, but you have to take the plans to action. They were like, reread it 13 times. I understand that part. But I guess like manifestation is just like, visualizing yourself that you know you're doing this and to me it makes sense in terms of like if you see yourself envision yourself running a marathon it'll like motivate you like oh i can do this it reminds yourself oh it's time to go work out time to practice time to condition for you know practicing for the marathon so manifestation does make sense to me but like it's not just like 
oh, I'm just gonna envision myself running a 10K marathon and then I, I, without any exercise, I'm gonna go run it and it's magically gonna work. I don't think manifestation is like that. And then he preaches the concept of the mastermind, which is the value of surrounding um, oneself with like-minded individuals to enhance, you know, your life, creativity, and problem solving, which I agree. And towards the end, they make like a whole like checklist, you know, and I guess like this is what we need to keep ourselves in line to keep ourselves motivated because often like motivation, you know, falters like, oh, I failed and it's like kind of like and slowly one by one, it's like whatever, I'm giving up. Yeah, maybe that's why Lana has made it successful. It's really motivating, you know, I feel more motivated already. So for the last two books, I did not like reread them for this video because I do not physically have time, okay? I'm really sorry, but let me know if you prefer that I do that. But I feel like I can trust what I say in these reviews because I've reread them a bunch of times and these these two are part of my favorites like collection, so I really like them. But let's start with The Bell Jar by Sylvia Plath. Okay, again, she's very controversial with, you know, I wrote this for like one of my college questions. It was like, pick one woman who you would love to converse with. I wrote, I would love to converse with Sylvia Plath. Plath, okay, let's not like sweep under the rug. Plath manages to fend like almost every race in her novel, The Bell Jar, besides her own, you know? But she is able to express the harrowing descent to depression and mental anguish. Her work of self-deprecation and ruthless honesty on the harms of limiting female roles at the time Isolation and paranoia is hard to read, but also provides comfort to many as they feel that they are not alone in such a journey. Many resonate with her book as it focuses on depression, giving eloquent language to such a private and horrible experience. With much of her work often exploring gender, identity, and social expectations, I would be curious to discuss her experiences as a woman in the mid-20th century and how these experiences have influenced her writing. I would also love to get her perspective on mental health during that era and how she views the current discourse of mental health and its destigmatization as many of her struggles with mental health are documented with her work surrounding such topics. I would love to know her thoughts on the legacy she has left on literature and feminist thought. Her bravery to release such work during a time where this topic was seen as taboo is truly commendable. Her experiences and insight make it an invaluable opportunity to gain a deeper understanding of the woman behind the words and the enduring impact of her work. So yeah, <laughs> you know, I was really kind with the, I didn't really talk about her issues, her racism. The Bell Jar is another semi-autobiographical novel. This was also published just a month before her death by suicide and the novel explores themes such as mental illness, identity, and the societal expectations placed on women, like I said in my um, mini college Q&A thing. So the story follows Esther Greenwood, who is a talented and quite ambitious young woman who goes to win a prestigious internship at a New York City magazine. And as she navigates the glamorous but like kind of controlling world of the 1950s society, she grapples with her own mental health issues. The title, The Bell Jar, symbolizes um, Esther's sense of isolation and suffocation, kind of like she's trapped under a glass bell because she's unable to fully connect with the outside world. As Esther's mental state deteriorates, she kind of breaks down and it leads to her hospitalization in a psychiatric like institution, but it also goes into like her internal and mental struggles, her relationships and the challenges she faces as she confronts the expectations placed upon her as a woman in that era. It sheds light on the mental health and the limitations imposed on women. But anyways, I think one of my favorite quotes is the one about the fig trees. I think everyone's heard this one, but it's the one about I saw my life branching out before me, like the green fig tree in the story. From the tip of every branch, like a fat purple fig, a wonderful future beckoned and winked. One fig was a husband and a happy home and children, and another fig was a famous poet, and another fig was a brilliant professor, and another fig was E.G., the amazing editor, and another fig was... you get it? I think that I truly lived that quote this year where I was just like, what do I want to do with my life? Because I'm graduating high school this year. And I was just like, there's so much I can do. Like, there's so much I want to do. I'm just haunted by the horrible, like, suffocating feeling of indecision. It's just a sense that I'm scared. Every choice I make for the future, I have to give up 10 other choices. Like, a fig, if I choose the wrong fig, the right fig might have already fell. 
and then by the time I realize that I chose the wrong fig and I try to go get the right fig, the right fig may have already rotted. You know what I mean? Like it's too late. And I think I truly understood that this year. I feel like before when I first read it, I was like, oh, like this is a nice quote, but I truly lived that this year when I like thought and I was like, what if like I realize, you know, that I don't really want to do this and I try to go back, but it's too late. Symbolism of, you know, the bell jar itself. I, I really like symbolism, okay, so. Some people love Sylvia Plath. I was on Reddit and someone's like, I hear Sylvia Plath, I upvote. I've heard like discourse on how like, there's so many other better, you know, female writers out there that can do the same as Sylvia Plath. So there's two ends of the spectrum in which both are valid. And we do have to acknowledge, you know, the issues with ideas she presents. So sorry if the lighting's a little different. It's a different day because I had to go to class after whatever I filmed yesterday, but. So the second book, is Lolita, another one of my favorites. Honestly, I think you need to search up for trigger warnings on every one of these books except for Think and Grow Rich. Sorry, it's not in focus, but yes. Lolita by Nabokov. I'm just gonna get into what this book's about and then maybe talk a few points about why I personally like this book because I think, you know, books resonate with people differently and people like books for different reasons. So Lolita was written by um, Vladimir Nabokov and it's narrated by Humbert Humbert. Please learn what an unreliable narrator is because that is essential in reading a lot of books by Nabokov honestly. But Humbert Humbert is a highly intelligent but morally wrong man who he becomes obsessed and infatuated by a 12 year old girl named Dolores Hayes but he likes to call her Lolita. So he becomes her stepfather after marrying her mother in order to become closer to Lolita, which is crazy. And as the novel progresses, it kind of explores like Humbert's obsessive and very t illegal and taboo relationship with Lolita. They're on a road trip across the US and you know, as the infatuation increases, Lolita also grows older and you know, mentally, she kind of changes too. What a lot of people like about it is Nabokov's writing because really good with words. The language I feel like is complex but also has wit in a certain way. But like obviously it's controversial for its, you know, taboo themes of romance between like pedophilia. <laughs> but it also goes into themes of morality, obsession, and you know, the consequences of unchecked desires. And I wrote about this once in an English lit FRQ this year for practice. It is wrong to have an ideal view of the world. That's where the mischief starts. That's where everything starts unraveling. It tells us to select a novel, play, or epic poem in which the character holds an ideal view of the world. Then write an essay in which you analyze the character's idealism and its positive or negative consequences. Explain how the author's portrayal of idealism illuminates the meaning of the work as a whole. And on it, one of the options is Lolita and I essentially wrote about how his idealism is basically how he sees romance and love. His view is essentially pedophilia but I wrote about how it brings him temporary joy as you know he's obsessed with Lolita, he acquires her, you know he takes her across the country but then eventually as the story progresses it also leads it is the reason of his downfall. He gets sent to jail and he eventually, spoilers I guess, like, okay this book has been out for a fucking long time, but he eventually gets sent to jail and then, and then dies in jail. So that leads to his downfall, which is a negative consequence. Unreliable narrators just hold a special place in my heart. If you like this book, honestly read, if you want like a more modern version, it's like My Dark Vanessa by like Elizabeth Russell, but yeah. Okay, congratulations, you've made it to the end of the video, but yeah. Thank you so much for watching and see you next time.